Okay, this is a short video to show the directory structure on RetroPy 2.3. Hopefully it'll be useful to show how it's all constructed so you can more easily manually configure areas that you need to like controller configuration or um, just the general emulation process and uh, which emulator to run at what point. And you can see where all the configuration files are. Um, I'll try to do it in a sort of structured manner so cover all the areas but I'm sure there'll be um, other bits that I can add in, a, in another video. Okay so to start with I'm going to use FileZilla or an FTP client to navigate through because it's going to be quicker and more visual than using a terminal session uh, but obviously you could do that uh, in there as well and you probably would when you edit uh, the files. So I'm just going to connect to my Raspberry which is uh, currently on this IP going in as user pi and password Raspberry and when that logs in, the first thing it does is connects you to your home directory. So the pi user, which we just logged in as, is uh, the root, which is that slash. That's the very sort of start of the directory structure, home pi. And if there are other users in the home directory, we'd see them listed here because that would be their home directory within that one. So as uh, you can see, you end up in this pi directory. Now all of the folders listed here, or directories listed here, with the full stop beforehand are hidden normally when you do a list um, so if you navigate or use this in a terminal session and you do a list command you might not see these unless you put a flag to show the hidden ones which I think is hyphen A and then you'd see these hidden ones as well but quite often you won't need those. So what you would see is a RetroPy directory here and a RetroPy setup directory here. Now if you go into the RetroPy setup directory that's where the script um, here, highlighted down the bottom, is run to configure the RetroPy side of things. So um, the .sh just means it's a shell script, kind of like a batch file in Windows. If you run that, you'll get a, a, a not a GUI, but a, a nice text interface to, that you can navigate with the keyboard and choose options. And to run it, you'd put something along the lines of sudo full stop forward slash RetroPy underscore setup .sh. And there's other videos uh, online showing you how to do that. But that's the location of it. You can see up here, whenever I navigate through, the remote site um, path I'm in is shown at the top. So it's within the Pi home directory, which is where you end up, and RetroPy setup. That's where that script live, which is quite useful. It's good to know that one uh, is there, so you can use that when you need to. Um, the other directory, back in, if I go back a step in Pi, if I go to RetroPy folder here, that's where the BIOS and the ROMs folder are. Now they're the ones that can be seen in Windows when you type the IP. So I'll just I'll see if I can show that. Um, so my IP is 192.168.0.103 and again this is just sort of the Windows side of it but you can see here I've typed um, let's make that a bit longer 192.168.0.3 and it's showing me a ROMs directory and uh, that ROMs directory is this one here, so if I go into ROMs, I get the same view, so that's automatically shared. So it's just another way of accessing it, and that's where all the ROMs are stored. So if I go into a given folder in Mega Drive, just get my list of ROMs, and that's in this path here. So I'll scroll back up. Again, you've got the BIOS folder, which uh, I think is used to grab the default BIOS of the system. Sometimes it's in the current directory as well, but it doesn't hurt to put the BIOS in here, so I've got a Neo Geo one and a GBA one um, sitting in there. So that's where the BIOS and the main ROMs folder live in terms of that structure, so it's under the main user, Pi, RetroPy BIOS. Now if we go back up to Pi, just see if there's anything else in this directory that you'd need reference to when you're using it. I think that's the main areas in here. One of the so in the dot emulation station directory here, under the home directory, uh, you can see default uh, default configuration files loaded here, ES underscore settings, ES underscore input. The input file is used for the controller within uh, emulation station itself when you navigate through that interface. And that can be configured when you boot into emulation station, it prompts you, it says press up, press down, and, and it saves the data within that file. And also if you add it in here, ES underscore systems dot CFG, that would overwrite the settings in the main systems uh, emulation station file, uh, configuration file which we'll see in a minute. Uh, separately in here you've got a game lists directory and that's one per system that's emulated so if we go into the Mega Drive 1 um, this would have a list of all the metadata so <coughs> excuse me so we've got 
uh, all of the um, data like the game description, where the image is held, um, the metadata like uh, publisher, genre, that sort of thing. But it will only use this one if there's not one already in the current ROMs directory. So it's kind of like an override for that. You can have it in here or you can have it in the actual ROMs directory, which we saw back um, in the directory and the Pi. It was RetroPy and then ROMs. So for example, if I go in my SNES uh, directory, I think I might have, yeah, I've got a gameless.xml there anyway. So that's the one that's used. So you can put them in either of those two folders. Okay. So just going back to the root, which is the top level of the directory structure, you can see these are the, the top level folders listed. And the only ones really that um, are non-standard, because this is all essentially a basic view of uh, Raspbian deployment, which is like Debian on Linux. So it's got the default set of folders here. And the ones that are of interest to us are ETC, which we'll look at in a minute, Home, and Opt, which I think is optional, this is basically the option of software, and in there we've got the RetroPy um, folder itself. The rest are a bit more system based, and you probably won't ever need to use anything in there. Now we started off looking at the home directory where we saw the Pi user and the folders that are within there and how they're used. Uh, if there's anything else, I can always add, uh, add to the comments later, but I think they're the core areas that we've already covered in that one. And in the ETC, one folder that's useful is, if we scroll down here, Emulation Station. In Emulation Station, you've got that ES underscore systems.cfg, and that's a really useful file. Um, ideally, if you want to edit it, it should go back in the dot emulation station directory we saw a minute ago in the home directory but you probably could edit it here and it'll be fine so if I hit view edit um, get that fired up you can see here that when a system's run um, let's get SNES as an example here we go so um, the structure of it is starts with a system tag then it's got the name Super Nintendo name SNES and the path uh, to the ROMs for that is the, this tilde sign which means the home directory which like we saw earlier it's home forward slash pi so that's just a shortcut to say home pi then it's retro pi and ROMs and SNES so you could change that if you wanted your ROMs to be held somewhere else these are the file extensions that RetroArch will um, or, or the system or rather emulation station will pay attention to when it shows the list of files so if you've got a ROM that isn't a SNES ROM that isn't one of those extensions, it won't show it. Then the command is the important section which runs all the way from there to there. And to run SNES emulator, it's going to go into this directory, apt retropy supplementary run command, it'll run this shell script and it'll pass that shell script, um, the retroarch main command here uh, with L flag, whatever L flag is, and then it will look at this shared, this essay is like a DLL in Windows, it's like a shared library. So it'll run that, so that's the sort of core emulator. And then it's saying the config file that it wants to pay attention to here is this RetroArch file, so it loads that. And then in addition, it will also uh, load this RetroArch file. We'll look at the directories in a minute, and you can see where those RetroArch files are. And then finally, it loads the ROM that the user selected. Um, so that's, you can see what it's going to run there. Um, separately, they've got different emulators here, so you could uncomment this by taking this out of the file, and it would run a SNES 9x emulator, whichever that one is, instead of RetroArch. So it's different options, uh, and they're all stored there. So you can add some, delete some, and change them as you'd want to. There, uh, that's pretty much all you need in the emulation station folder. Although that is also where the themes are stored. So you can see in themes. Simple, it's got, uh, for the simple theme, it's got all of these for each individual one. So if I go in the Mega Drive one, it's got a theme.xml there, and within the art folder, it's got the graphics used. Um, so you can sort of replicate that with a new ins by installing new themes at, um, at the top level, which is there, ETC Emulation Station Themes. Put some more in, in there. Uh, okay, so that was the Emulation Station folder inside the ETC. And the other folder that we're interested in is OPT. So I'll click that, and that stands for the optional software that's installed on a Linux distribution. And in this example, we've got RetroPy as the main one we'll be looking at. So this is where all of the RetroPy specific scripts and emulators are stored. Inside there, you've got four directories. The emulator cores, you won't need to use much at all, if ever. It's purely the sort of main shared files for all of the 
emulators I mean, inside here you just see a series of usually SA files you don't need these you can leave that alone um, we've got emulator folder which is where all the emulators like RetroArch are stored so in RetroArch we've got a list now um, in emulators we've got a list now of all the emulators and including RetroArch so inside there is where RetroArch is stored um, it's in the installed there and then bin you've got the actual programs themselves but you shouldn't need to change those I don't think we need anything oh the configs in RetroArch configs this is where RetroArch will automatically um, store and detect when you plug in your USB controller or the controllers that you're using um, there's a script within the retro uh, where we saw right on early in the video a script about um, retro pi setup and within that there's a way to um, detect what USB controller you've got and I've got a separate video showing you how to do that um, and here you can see for example if I edit one of these files it simply stores the buttons for that controller um, and you can edit these and, and change it if you if you need to but that's where they're all stored and you can tell the last time you've edited one of these usually by looking at the date stamp so you know if it's a, a recent one that you've done um, what else? in here RetroArch shader this is where all the shaders are stored so that's the way that um, the system will affect the sort of graphic overlay on that type of um, detail um, you can install those and edit those in a retroarch.cfg file that we've seen earlier um, there's another video for that um, how to edit the shaders uh, we'll look at that in a second but that's where they're all stored and you can um, add more in there and um, and see which ones are listed there's quite a few for the SNES down here you can try out different uh, looks and feels okay so that was the retroarch shader one We've got um, RetroArch CFG. Now, I'm not sure if that RetroArch CFG is used because it doesn't seem to be referenced by the um, config files. Uh, I think it's the separate ones. So, to see the separate ones, it uh, looks like I might have just been disconnected there. Let me just try that again. Okay, back in there. Um, what we want to do is go into the OPT and RetroPy again and rather than emulators to get through to the RetroPy um, RetroArch folder that we just saw if you go up a directory there and go into configs you can see uh, there's a list of folders which pretty much map the emulators let's go into, well it doesn't really matter, if we choose SNES you can see there's a RetroArch.cfg and this is used by RetroArch when it boots up inside there you can see that it's pretty short and all it's doing here is assigning a specific shader automatically to that so when you do fire up SNES in my example I've got um, this SNES phosphor shader automatically loaded and separately to that you've got a parent configuration file in the all directory so whichever RetroArch emulator or emulation you use it will always load this RetroArch CFG which is a lot more detailed so again I'll bring that one up you can see the vast majority of the lines here have got this comment, um, hash sign next to it which means it's commented out which means it isn't read so there aren't any sort of major changes I'm using when I boot up my emulator they're all it's not going to pay attention to these as it goes down but if you wanted to change something you could um, here's some that are uncommented un so it is assigning a keyboard input when I load up um, RetroArch it is saying that these um, keys would be applicable in the particular uh, emulator and that you can see you can just run down this and see um, lots of different configuration options that are possible um, ones that you can enable or disable as you go down but that was a um, sort of quick overview of where some configuration files are in RetroPy on the Raspberry Pi uh, hopefully that's going to help some of you if you've got any queries or um, questions about um, what's possible uh, drop it down in the comments and I'll try to help. I know that some people do talk about um, controllers particularly. Now, we saw earlier in that configs file in RetroArch it automatically detects and stores the list of controllers there but I think what is possible is um, within here and you've got your controller um, system specific folders you could put entries in these RetroArch folders uh, that refer to your game button so it would override on a persistent basis and you can see an example in the all in the overarching one if I open that up again you can see somewhere down here 
we've got um, reference to joypad. Let's just have a look. Joypad. Okay, joypad driver. It's down here, keyboard and joypad buttons. So I think if you uncommented these or put them into the system specific retroarch folders and put your button usage there, it would override um, the auto detection. So you could say a particular setup for different systems. I haven't tried that, but um, that sounds possible. And like I say, any other questions, add them in the comments. Thanks.